duty is sacrifice. It eclipses all things, even blood. In the making of season one, we knew half that season is a prologue and half of it is the first act of this war. To have season one land the way it did with a, a rabid audience, fans of George and his books the way I am. We were excited to get into it because this is the juicy part of the drama. Okay. Can you check your ears out for? Because the North owes a great duty to the Seven Kingdoms, one older than any oath. Winterfell is the one place, the one corner of this world where news of Luke's death has not yet reached. And it is this oh, I you were uh, hearkening from. back to a simpler time. I wanted to go to a place to, where we could experience that, I if only briefly, and the North just felt that, completely the right way to up. go. Ryan, when we did speak, it really, really helped me out because we would have conversations about how important these negotiations are for Team Black and the, the, the difference it makes in the war. War is coming. To the whole of the realm, my lord. We cannot wage it without the support of the North. Well, it was all about history. There were pledges that were made back in the day, and Jace is sent to remind Craig and Stark of those pledges. If your greybeards can fight, the Queen will have them. They will fight hard, like Northerners. Rhaenyra heard the news that Luke has died on a mission that she sent him on, so there's guilt involved, and she's a mother who's lost a son and has to go through the sort of necessary grieving process that uh, Damon, um, her husband, can't really appreciate or understand. She goes and tries to make peace with Luke's demise, but she cannot settle in it because it is unsettled business until part of Arix washes ashore. Going in search of evidence is quite fundamentally important to her. I guess one of the sort of maddest things about death is that it seems sort of impossible especially because really the overriding feeling often is you just sit with the absence and so anything that has like a tangibility about it I think is vitally important. Her son's cloak, uh, the wing of his dragon, I think it's devastating but I think it galvanizes a vengeful feeling, one that maybe she hasn't paid so much mind to previously. I think that Rhaenys is probably one of the few people that Damon knows he can't mess with, although I suspect probably wants to. We're going to King's Landing. To what end? Killing Vagar. When those two meet, it's kind of like a panther meets a kind of electric eel. Really dangerous combination. He's essentially ready to go to war and, and get payback. It was nice to throw those characters into conflict with one another. I think you can tell from even her demeanor the way uh, Rhaenys thinks of Damon. Damon believes that he's, of course, completely in the right and has the power to order Rhaenys around. Fly with me. It is a command. Would that you were the king. <laughs> Where is your Harris? What do you need of him? Taking him to the small council. He'll be king one day. He must begin his instruction. What if he does not want to be king? Where is he? One of the things I loved about Game of Thrones was character humor. And, you know, that we could spend a lot of time being dour in this world, and it's so important to have humor. And when I first saw what Tom Glenn Carney was doing with Aegon, I thought, he's finding humor where I didn't know it existed. And it's painful, a guy who's way in over his head, who really wants to do well, but it just can't make a right move, to, <laughs> no matter what he does. Aegon the Magnanimous. Hail King Aegon. The Magnanimous. I think Ekon is uh, the kind of father that encourages bad behavior because he finds it funny. He loves his kids. I, I have no doubt about that. He loves his kids dearly, but I, I, he's, he's not one to discipline them. If anything, he's, you know, having competitions with his children to see who can be the most rebellious. And Egon often wins. Would someone please? Is the heir to the throne bothering you, Thailand? We see him come into small council meeting with Jaehaerys and... Uh, you know, he's, he's spurring him on, he's wanting him to be more of a more of a rebel, more of a nuisance, just like his old man. I think he wants a ride. Your Grace. A, a ride? A pony ride. Wouldn't that be fun, Jaehaerys? Should the Master of Coin be your royal steed? <laughs> <laughs> it's meant to be a moment of fun a bit, and yes, uh, look, Egon brings his, his four-year-old to work. But I think on a perhaps nuanced character level, this is the thing that Viserys never did for Egon. 
And Aegon did not study at the feet of his father. His father had his male heir and then essentially said, well, that, that box is ticked. He was ill. I think he enjoyed having a son, but didn't put in the work the way he did with Rhaenyra when he was a younger man. And I think Aegon resents that and feels that part of the reason that he's not seen as being suited for the, for the crown or the throne is because he didn't get that training from his father. So now he's going to make up for that tenfold with Jaehaerys. Allison's been in a marriage that was loving, but not exactly romantic or physical for quite some time. Cole has got a lot of issues. One thing I love about the character is that he is a knight in shining armor and sort of classically handsome and probably the most messed up person in the story. And then he's <laughs> clinging to notions of purity and, and duty and just flagrantly breaking them left and right. So there's a lot of complex things driving the moves the closer and closer between Allison and Cole. And it takes a leap forward, but nothing is simple with them. So for every leap forward, there's a pushback. We cannot. Again. There's a lot of wonderful tension. Oh, yeah. 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 I think ultimately they're two very lost people in a pretty unforgiving world. And I, I think there's always been, you know, since the very first episode, Alison, you know, had her eye on Kristen Cole and then she was a young lady and now she's the queen of the Seven Kingdoms. But I think also Alison has been like a secret because in no so many messed up situations disintegrate. She's probably just not uh, quite right in that respect in the first so place. Who knows what he would do if he found out that his mother was having sex with his commander of the king's guard. I mean, not only is it an embarrassment, it would bring deep, deep shame. Yeah, and it's Aaron like a friggin' Aemon Targaryen. Rhaenyra has literally one line. Thing that's punishable by she death. Says, like um, Damon <laughs> takes as a, uh, pulling the trigger. In our first episode, we see him unleash something that is sort of famous in the lore of House of the Dragon, a nasty event that he triggers. When Rhaenyra declares that she wants Aemon, I think it's an admission of a possibly shameful desire. And I think that admission is made directly to Damon. I think it's also an, an admission of their similarity. She sort of discloses another way in which they actually share a darkness. I want Aemon Targaryen. And becomes the battle cry that then resonates across the entire season because that is the, the next domino to fall in this back and forth that sets in motion a uh, horrible attack and counterattack that continues and the atrocities grow worse and worse as they go. In our story, it's uh, Ms. Arya, who has got her tentacles in every part of King's Landing, is able to provide like, connections for Damon to uh, exact revenge. I think it really is a big deal for the fans because it keeps getting referred to. And I don't know the characters' actual names. They're forever in lore as blood and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> She's the queen. She's a son for a son, he said. The boldest thing that I think we did there was decide to give the last... 10 minutes of the episode over to these two characters that we had never met before and rely on them to take us through the end of the story and to see hopefully as they go deeper and deeper into their right teeth and as we're spending more and more I want to know why they brought the dog is going to happen in there and, and oh, knowing that the dog is probably chased down the rats or something and seeing that play out hopefully is the fun and the and the horror because they are rats that's well, the one guy is a rat catcher right right that's a big heavy set I didn't think about it that way I just thought he's a rat catcher yeah, sure, he just really catches the rats rat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to find out what people were saying that they disliked about the whole blood and cheese scenario because everybody knew it was going to be awful and if anything I thought what they shared was tame compared to what was in the books all right, I'm just going to read this. Are you just reading it? Reading and commenting when I feel like it. Amidst the stews of Flea Bottom, Prince Damon's go-between found suitable instruments. One had been a surgeon in the city watch. Big and brutal, he had lost his gold cloak for beating a whore to death in a drunken rage. The other was a rat catcher in the Red Keep. Their true names are lost to history. They are remembered, would that they were not, as Blood and Cheese. From Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin. In my review of the season two premiere of House of the Dragon, 
I noted that I'd been dreading the blood and cheese since reading it in Fire and Blood, the George R. R. Martin book this show is based on. Turned out the scene itself, however horrific, was still not nearly as graphic or terrifying as the book scene. This isn't surprising. Many changes have been made from the Martin's fantastical history of Westeros. The book is told as though it's an actual history. It's written by a fictional maester. Maester, I think earlier I had called them monks. Maesters is what I meant. Who uses various sources to fill in the blanks of history. One of the chief sources is the Jester Mushroom, whose accounting of the assassination of Prince Jaehaerys is used alongside much speculation. Likewise, during the season one finale, we got a very different version of the death of Lucerus Valerian. In the book, Aemon sets out to kill the boy. In the show, he's merely terrorizing him. It's the dragon Vagar who, against her rider's will, slaughters Aemon's nephew and the much smaller dragon Eryx. Aemon, however cruel and sadistic, was shocked and dismayed. Whether that was true remorse or simply worry at what events this would set in motion and his mother's reaction is harder to parse. Point is, I don't mind changes from the book. I actually love how this adaptation is framing those changes. The book is history, prone to mistake, shrouded by time, based on unreliable sources. The show is the true telling of these events. I love how clever that is. Even if I agree with a lot of fans that the blood and cheese scene was better in the book. I do definitely agree with that. That being said, I think a middle ground between what the show did and what the book did would be ideal. The book's version of this scene includes something I personally believe is wildly overused in fiction these days. Rape, or in this case, the threat of rape. Worse, it's the threat of child rape which I think is unnecessarily graphic and potentially triggering. On the other hand, I think the show could have included this without being explicit. In any case, let's compare the differences in versions. In the show, the rat catcher known as Cheese and the disgraced gold cloak known as Blood, disgraced for his penchant for sexual assault, are commissioned by Damon Targaryen to kill Aemon. They ask Damon, what if they can't find Aemon? And the scene cuts away. My strong suspicion is that he tells them any son will do, a son for a son, even if it's not the one who killed Lucerus, even if it's a small child. In the book, we never learn who Damon wanted assassinated. It's merely speculation that it could have even been King Aegon himself, though it's also speculated that he would have been too difficult a target for the assassins, given the king's guard that surrounded him at all times. In the book, Blood and She sneak into Allison's chambers, knowing that Queen Helena and her three children, twins, Jaehaerys and Jahera, each six years old, and the boy, Maelor, too, to say goodnight to their grandmother every evening. Here, the bind and gag, the dowager queen and blood strangles her bedmaid. When Helena and her children arrive, Blood bars the doors and kills the lone guardsman accompanying the queen. Scream and you'll die, Blood says. The queen, still calm, demands, who are you of the killers? Debt collectors, Cheese replies. An eye for an eye, a son for a son. We only want the one to square things. Won't hurt the rest of you, of you fine folks. Not one little hair. Then he gives Helena a terrible choice. Jaehaerys or Maelor? She has to decide. Damon himself first wrote, An eye for an eye, a son for a son. Lucera shall be avenged. It's clear that he conveyed these words to his hirelings. She tells the queen that if she won't choose, blood will have his way with little Jahera, which is a horrifying enough thing that I understand perfectly why the writers left it out of the adaptation. See, I had forgotten about that in the book. If I were to adapt this scene, I would leave it out too, though I would include something more subtle, like she's telling the queen, 
You don't want him to make you choose your grace and showing Helena a look at blood who is leering at the girl. It wouldn't take much to convey what that means. Helena begs for them to kill her instead, but Cheese tells her it has to be a boy. Pick or we will kill them all, Cheese says. Helena chooses Maylor. In the book, the maester historian speculates that it's because the boy is so young and wouldn't understand what's going on, or alternatively, that she wanted to protect her husband's brother's heir. Cheese turns to Maylor and tells the toddler, You hear that, little boy? Your mama wants you dead. That I definitely remember. He then turns to Blood and grins, and Blood lops off poor Jairus' head instead, at which point Helena, far from quiet, collected version of the character we see on screen, begins to scream. Blood and Cheese flee the scene, leaving everyone else physically unscathed but emotionally devastated. We get our first taste of just how wicked Team Black can be, and another reminder that there are not really good guys on this show, only less worse guys. I would say that hiring these people that they don't actually know from a hole in the wall is not an indication of the goodness or badness. It's the reality that Damon already hired cut purses to do various things. He had no problem with doing something like that. And from what I remember in the books, like a lot of people blamed Rhaenyra. Yes, according to the show, she is the one that gave the command that she wants Aemon, which is awful enough that she's also just had her freaking kid killed and just had a miscarriage. So she's not exactly in a fucking great emotional state to be making decisions like that. Damon, as I said, he's been this way. This is how he is. Expecting him to be something else that he's not is stupid, in my opinion. This is how he's going to be. Damon himself is not an indication on how all of the blacks are. Damon is his own special kind of person. The clearly book scene is far more violent and terrifying than the show scene, though that was plenty grim. What works better in the book are two things. First, Alicent is present, bearing witness to the black and rotten fruit of her betrayal. In the show, she's sleeping with her Sir Kristen Cole while this all takes place. She, she ain't sleeping. She is in the middle of her thing. However you want to put it. I can understand how this might work to spur her guilt in other ways, but I still prefer the book version. Yes, the show is humanizing Alicent. No, that doesn't mean she shouldn't be present for this terrible vengeance. Second, the Sophie's choice in the book is much more compelling. In the show, Helena merely has to point out which of the two is the boy something the killers could have figured out easily on their own. In the book, however, she has to literally pick which of her two sons lives and which dies. Worse, the surviving son has to live with the fact that she picked him first, though he's young enough to hopefully forget, and they kill the elder son instead. I mean, honestly, I don't think the child would have remembered at all, but if they have anybody else that knows, they're going to freaking talk. And if it's kids that know, they'll intentionally talk just to be mean because that's unfortunately something kids do. Not all of them, but some of them. I do think the show was correct in keeping the actual killing of Jaehaerys off screen. Nobody wants to see that. In many ways, the blood and cheese scene in Fire and Blood is the red wedding of that book. By far the book's most depraved and shocking moment, and in some ways even more terrible than Rob Stark's downfall. The biggest difference, if we are being honest, is our emotional attachment to the characters. This is an issue with House of the Dragon as a whole. The characters are much harder to care about and relate to in this show than in Thrones, which had some actual heroes. You felt sad and infuriated after the Red Wedding. Here, you feel only shock and horror. I would argue much the same for the death of Lucerus, which was shocking, but didn't make me particularly sad. What do you think of the changes? Let me know on Twitter and Facebook. And that was a Forbes article by Eric King.
I definitely think there were changes that were a problem. If people thought that it was too tame, I think that's beside the point and dumb. Like, people were complaining about how awful it was in the book in the first place. It could very well have been that the show producers wanted to appease the many, many people that were complaining about how awful that was going to be. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, that's all I got for you this week. See you next week. Bye. Until next time, I'll see you when I see you. If you like this video, please click the like button. If you want more content, click subscribe. If you click that little bell and click all, then you'll get more content notifications.